Welcome to the Story Surgeon Podcast. I'm your host, Ekta Bali, midwife, fantasy author, podcaster, and story enthusiast. And this is the show where I dissect and break open novels, movies, and TV shows and figure out what makes them work. If you missed it last week, I published two books. The first is the second book in my middle grade fantasy adventure series. It's called The Fae Princess, which is book two of the Pacific Princesses series. And the second is a non-fiction book for my midwifery students out there called A Guide to the Postnatal Ward for Midwifery Students and New Grads. You can find them as well as a list of my other published works and notes from this episode at my website, ektabali.com. That's E-K-T-A-A-B-A-L-I.com. So on our second episode, we're diving deep into Harry Potter. But why do a Harry Potter series? Isn't it overdone? For me, as with many others, for decades I've loved these books as a reader and as a consumer. So now that I'm an author, I really want to get into the weeds of what actually makes these books great. I want to put on the lens of a creative, of an author, and analyse them as objectively as I can. We learn from the greats, and J.K. Rowling is undoubtedly in the history books as one of those greats. Dean Wesley Smith, a prolific author in the writing community, encourages authors to look at people who do it best and learn from them and imitate them until you become great yourself. So without further ado, let's get into Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. So as we know, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone was published by Bloomsbury in June 1997. The movie came out in 2001 and grossed $1 billion USD. There is some debate under which section to shelve Harry Potter in, as books 1 to 3 can be solidly middle grade, but once you hit book 4, we find we have to shelve them under YA because of the change in themes. So Harry is 11 in book 1, so we'll call this middle grade. Now, this is my least favourite Harry Potter book, and I know a lot of people feel this way, and I'm going to go into the reasons why this is. It's very unusual for the book one to be the least favourite, so it's a testament to the quality of the story that the books get better and better up until probably book six. But today we're dissecting book one, so let's get right into it. For those of you who have forgotten what happens in book one, allow me to do a quick summary. If you have no troubles remembering, skip ahead. Harry thinks he's a regular boy whose parents died in a car crash, living in the cupboard under the stairs with his terrible aunt and uncle. One day, a gigantic strange man tells him who he really is, a wizard belonging to a long line of powerful wizards, and that his place is at Hogwarts, a wizarding school. He finds out that his parents were killed by a powerful wizard who was trying to kill him too, but for some reason, the curse bounced back, leading to Voldemort's demise. Harry begins his new life exploring the wonders of witchcraft and wizardry when he discovers something sinister is going on with a secret object kept hidden in the school. One of the teachers, Professor Snape, appears to be trying to get to the object. The object turns out to be the Philosopher's Stone. An object made to give you immortality. And Harry is told that Voldemort is trying to use it to get his life back. Snape appears to be working for him. It all comes to a head when Snape appears to lure Dumbledore, the headmaster, away from the school so he can get into the heavily guarded stone. Harry and friends follow close behind, solving the puzzles and getting past the defences when Harry comes face to face with Quirrell, a stuttering professor we never suspected who Voldemort has been piggybacking on this whole time under his turban. Harry retrieves the stone without Voldemort knowing, and Quirrell tries to come after Harry, but as soon as he touches Harry, he melts and dies, and Voldemort flees. Alright, so let's look at our book statistics. We are 80,000 words, making the book 295 pages. There are 17 chapters. Each chapter averages 4,500 words, The longest chapters are chapter 5, Diagon Alley, and chapter 16, Through the Trap Door, both at about 6,500 words. Each chapter starts with a wide angle of of the wider picture and narrows back down to Harry's experience. Now, let's look at the structure of Philosopher's Stone. 
Rowling hits our traditional fiction milestones pretty accurately. So we have our inciting incident at 16% on page 50. We have a whole heap of fun and games before we hit our midpoint turn at 50% in chapter 9, which is where the trio find the third floor corridor. Um, We get our climax at 82% and then hit our resolution at 93% of the story. So Rowling follows a hero's journey to shape the plot quite precisely. And in fact, it's pretty beat by beat. So we have the call to adventure, which is when we get our letters from Hogwarts, the refusal of the call, the Dursleys refuse uh, him or deny him access to his letters, supernatural aid, finally Hagrid comes to explain everything, the crossing of the first threshold, literally we cross into platform nine and three quarters, the belly of the whale, we literally cross the gigantic lake to get to Hogwarts, the road of trials, um, Harry faces a whole heap of trials like his new school, his lessons, um, Malfoy, Quidditch, uh, meeting the goddess, where we get items to help us on our journey, and Harry receives the invisibility cloak on Christmas Day. The woman as temptress, this is in the form of the mirror of Erised, with desire being one of the main themes. Atonement of the father, we get a conversation with Dumbledore about Harry's parents, plus Quidditch, which is one of the things his father was good at. They both share that together. I'm going to add here the Abyss, uh, which is the Dark Knight of the Soul. The trio are in uh, in disgrace for losing house points. Uh, Apotheosis, Harry meets Quirrell in front of the mirror and realizes a stone has been given to him. The ultimate boon, the goal has been achieved. Harry has the stone and Voldemort flees, having been burned. Refusal of the return and magic flight. Uh, from here on, we kind of hit our resolution points, which in the Philosopher's Stone is quite short. We only get a couple of pages of resolution. We definitely cross the return threshold. Harry goes back on the Hogwarts Express, the master of two worlds. Harry has to tolerate the summer before he goes back to Hogwarts and he is going to have a lot of fun with Dudley because they don't know that he can't do magic outside of school which is the freedom to live point. So all 17 points are followed pretty closely by Rowling. Now I would argue that it's the subplots that really make Harry Potter what it is. As Brandon Sanderson says, ideas are cheap, execution is everything. And he also goes on to say that you can't base a book off of one idea. You need a few ideas. And J.K. Rowling has ideas in bucket loads. The main plot in each book is like a thread that carries us through. But we're really there to experience the other stuff, the subplots. I don't know if I quite cared about the Philosopher's Stone that much, but I know that I cared a hell of a lot about the other stuff. So in the Philosopher's Stone, the main plot is the thing that's been guarded by Fluffy, that's been tried to be stolen, and also our Nicholas Flamel. Our subplot includes Hogwarts school life, plus Harry learning magic, the Draco rivalry, Quidditch plays a huge part in this book, and we get a small chapter on Norbert the dragon, that storyline. Rowling does this thing where her subplots are inseparable from the main plot. They are woven so closely together. So I figured out why this book is my least favourite in the series. And it's because of two main things that Rowling has used as plot devices and means of moving the plot forward. And they are assumptions and coincidences. Okay, so... I noticed there was a lot of assuming going on by means of Harry thinking something is happening that actually turns out to be true. He assumes that Snape is up to no good. Harry assumes that Snape used the rampaging troll as a diversion without any evidence. Harry assumes that Dumbledore has left because Snape has used a letter as a diversion again without any evidence. 
These are really convenient to the plot, but they make for very little reader satisfaction. Next, our plot moves forward via coincidence, not by figuring out or smarts or by any other effort on the character's parts. It's a coincidence that Neville opens a chocolate fl- frog mentioning Nicholas Fermel. It's a coincidence that Harry walks in on Snape and Filch um, trying to heal Snape's injury amongst a whole heap of others. Having the characters figure out what's going on via coincidence could be classed as at best cheating and at worst lazy writing. In Pixar's 22 Rules for Storytelling, one of them is Getting your characters into trouble by a coincidence is a good idea, but having them get out of that trouble by coincidence is cheating. We want our characters to figure things out, use their strengths and overcome their weaknesses to figure out what's going on and solve the problem and overcome their issues. This is why the sequence in the climax is enjoyable, because our trio solve each trial on their own. Ron with his chess ability, Harry with his skilled flying, and Hermione's logic and knowledge. And I think that's the heart of creating satisfying solutions to problems. Next, let's move on to character. Rowling uses caricatures inspired by old English fairy tales. Our characters, even secondary and tertiary characters, are given features and behaviours that marks them in our minds. Rowling is a master at this, at creating memorable characters we like or do not like immediately, and she does this using a few techniques. The first is giving each character a stark feature we can recognise them by instantly, in a few words. These are usually physical, and each one is very distinct from the other. Harry has messy jet black hair, a lightning bolt shaped scar and green eyes, Hermione has bushy brown hair and large teeth. Ron has vibrant red hair and freckles. Dumbledore has long, a long white beard and half moon spectacles. Snape has a hooked nose and greasy black hair. Quirrell wears a purple turban and has a distinct stutter. And Hagrid is our friendly giant. Each of these characters is given literally only two, sometimes three, clear physical attributes that give the reader an an immediate visual image and that's all we need to recognize them by. The second way Rowling creates memorable characters is her masterful writing. We have a large cast of characters but we never feel overwhelmed by them. The way they speak and behave is all very distinct. We know exactly what type of person each character is. While some of them are archetypes like Dumbledore, The rest of them are definitely caricatures that we flesh out more as the series moves on. We'll talk about J.K. Rowling's writing a little up ahead. Now, as for Harry, so just a few notes on some of our main characters. Harry fills the exiled infant chosen one trope of the Joseph Campbell archetypes. He has had a terrible childhood and was torn away from his parents, but We like him as the underdog and eventually he goes on on his arc to become the master of everything. Now we have one of our antagonists, Draco. When Harry first meets Draco, he immediately thinks of Dudley. So this is a technique Rowling has used. We establish how we feel about this character through reference or comparison to a previously well-established character. We were with Dudley for about three or four chapters in the setup. Now with Snape, the reader is made to hate him immediately and Rowling does this by showing us that he is unfair and cruel and uh, we first sort of see that in the class down in the dungeons that we have with him, our first class. Rowling's tertiary characters are all caricatures. Rowling's tertiary characters are all caricatures but they are all very well developed. For example, with uh, Filch, Mrs. Norris, and the other teachers, Peeves, we have a really clear picture of exactly who and what they are. Next up, let's talk about theme. Now, I've noted two key themes in Philosopher's Stone. The first is desire, and the second is friendship. 
So desire as a theme is central to Philosopher's Stone and is directly used as a cause for Harry's ultimate win at the end of the climax. We are quite literally shown the perils of desire in three key instances. One, literally at the mirror of Erised, desire is spelled backwards, although I never figured that out as a 10-year-old. Dumbledore teaches Harry, men have wasted away before it, entranced by what they have seen, driven mad, not knowing if what it shows is real or even possible. It does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. That is page 229 to page 230. Now, number two, Ferenz the centaur teaches Harry that using unicorn blood to prolong life leads to a cursed life and then links that back to the philosopher's stone elixir. And number three, Dumbledore teaches Harry after the big climax that Harry was able to retrieve the philosopher's stone because he did not desire it for himself. You know, the stone was really not such a wonderful thing. As much money and life as you could want. The two things most human beings would choose above all. The trouble is, humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things which are the worst for them. That's page 320. Our second theme is friendship. We see friendship as a big theme in this book. And this is interesting for me in book one because here is where we are forming the start of our long-lasting relationships and friendships that will span the course of seven books. Firstly, we see the establishment of the Harry and Ron relationship by way of Harry refusing Malfoy's offer to be friends. Harry chose the higher path here. And second, the establishment of Hermione as a permanent part of their group via altruism. Harry remembers Hermione is crying in the toilets and they run off to warn her during the troll attack. Subsequently, Hermione shoulders the blame when Harry and Ron are getting into trouble. Thus, their friendship is cemented and based on the three of them following the higher path. Thus, the basis of friendships throughout the entire series henceforth is altruism, sacrifice and humility. And three, we see the Neville subplot completed by Dumbledore in the final chapter where he says, There are all kinds of courage, said Dumbledore, smiling. It takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. I therefore award 10 points to Mr. Neville Longbottom. That's page 329. Now, let us delve into J.K. Rowling's masterful writing. We start chapter 1 in the third person omniscient. We know this because we get this line where we are being directly spoken to by the narrator. When Mr. and Mrs. Dursley woke up on on the dull grey Tuesday our story starts, there was nothing about the cloudy sky outside to suggest the strange and mysterious things would soon be happening all over the country. That's page two. Most of the book is written in third person limited to Harry's perspective and we break from this usually at the start of each chapter where Rowling gives us a bird's eye view of the setting before she zooms in to Harry. Occasionally she breaks on Harry to give an omniscient view, for example when she shows Hermione trying to set the counter curse on Snape or in exposition to move a long time. And actually, in the entire Harry Potter series, we don't actually get too much shift away from Harry's point of view. The only chapters we move away are this first chapter in book one, chapter one of book four, chapter one of book six, and chapter one of book seven. She almost uses them as a prologue in books four, six, and seven. As Brandon Sanderson says, prologues are a promise to the reader that here is what you can expect after I set this all up for you. It's a promise of tone and action. It's saying, if you stick with me, this is what you can expect up ahead. So chapter one of book one actually gets the brunt of criticism out of the whole series. It seems to be an opening that people really don't like. In this book, Rowling is using an adult's perspective to highlight the weird and unusual. And throughout the series, we see Harry's uncle and aunt as our mechanism of stark contrast. 
This is our known world and point one of the hero's journey. So in chapter one, we're given 2,000 words or halfway because this is a 4,600 word chapter before we head into Dumbledore and McGonagall's conversation, which if we aren't hooked by Vernon's observations of the strange, our little party of wizards on Previt Gile will definitely hook us in. I think this is probably the reason why people don't like how Harry Potter is opened. Uncle Vernon is universally hated by all, and to start the series off with him seems unnecessary and uncomfortable to me. It really sits apart as a chapter from the rest of the entire series. We never get an Uncle Vernon POV ever again, and thank God for that. He's super uninteresting. Is this the reason why Rowling got so many rejections back when she was trying to sell this book? Publishers judge a writer by their first chapter. And if this is everyone's least favourite, perhaps it would have been better off jumping straight into the Dumbledore and McGonagall section like the movie did. So ignoring the first 2,000 words of the series, Rowling's writing is charming in the way that old English fairy tales are charming. Or even the newer tales. It has the same charm as Narnia, for example, where everything is so wonderful, cosy and fantastical that even the darker elements have a hint of this quality. It gives us a real sense of escapism. Her style of writing really made the world of Harry Potter somewhere kids and adults could escape to without feeling belittled or stupid for doing so. The problems in Harry's world feel very real and serious, but nestled in amongst the fantastical elements, themes, humour and witticisms, we find comfort and security. Rowling is truly a master storyteller, and she executes detailed world building in a way that entrances us, while she seemingly doesn't bat an eyelid. The whole thing comes off as effortless. I'd like to speak about chapter 5, Diagon Alley, for a bit. I think it's a masterful chapter and shows us how she gives us a large amount of new information very quickly without us feeling overwhelmed by it. In fact, it excites us and makes us eager to turn the page. This chapter is our breaking into the second act chapter. It's our leaving the old world and entering the new world. Instead of bringing us straight to Hogwarts and doing massive info dumps, we're given Diagon Alley, an in-between place where we can acclimatise and be given hints about new concepts. Now, nothing is explained in depth, mind you, there's a lot of foreshadowing and hinting going on, and this happens in the form of Draco Malfoy, who serves as our explainer before Hermione arrives to be the informant for the rest of the series. Malfoy's scene is an excellent example of how to show and not tell, and it's done with Draco bragging to Harry in Madame Malkin's robes shop. He also provide, provides us with foreshadowing for the whole series. The pure blood versus muggle blood is introduced here too. So we're given a hell of a lot of information in chapter 5, but it feels good to the reader. It makes them hungry for more rather than be overwhelmed with info dumps. I highly recommend you take a look at it. If this much information can be given to kids in a middle grade fantasy, we should be able to do it for adults as well. So how is it done? Through natural conversation. Hagrid does a bit of explaining, but it's mostly with conversation with other magical folk and the reader is left to insinuate the information. It's not given to us easily or boringly either. Each bit of conversation really shows characterization. We immediately know how each character is by the way they converse with Harry. First Quirrell, Malfoy, Ollivander. Rowling does characterization extremely well. I think it's partly why these books are so popular. Yes, the characters might be archetypes or caricatures, but we can basically immediately see who they are within the first few lines of them speaking. Note how later on she introduces the Weasleys. Packed with muggles, of course. Harry swung around. The speaker was a plump woman who was talking to four boys, with all with flaming red hair. Each of them was pushing a trunk like Harry's in front of him, and they had an owl. 
Heart hammering, Harry pushed his trolley after them. They stopped, and so did he, just near enough to hear what they were saying. Now what's the platform number? said the boy's mother. Nine and three quarters, piped a small girl, also red-headed, who was holding her hand. Mum, can't I go? You're not old enough, Ginny. Now be quiet. All right, Percy, you go first. What looked like the oldest boy marched towards platforms nine and ten. Harry watched, careful not to blink in case he missed it. But just as the boy reached the divide between the two platforms, a large crowd of tourists came swarming out in front of him, and by the time the last rucksack had cleared away, the boy had vanished. Fred, you next, the plump woman said. I'm not Fred, I'm George, said the boy. Honestly, woman, you call yourself our mother. Can't you tell I'm George? Sorry, George, dear. Only joking, I am Fred, said the boy, and off he went. His twin called after him to hurry up. And he must have done, because a second later he had gone. But how had he done it? And that's page 98 to 99. We're given action, explanation, mystery, and characterization of new characters all in one passage. This is why Rowling is a masterful storyteller. It's depth and conciseness all at the same time. We're introduced to five new characters and we don't even feel overwhelmed. Now, Rowling is also a master at foreshadowing. She creates surprising twists by foreshadowing them very briefly, usually one sentence. Quirrell is knocked over while Hermione thinks she's going to cast a counter curse at Snape. This is in one line. The noble dragon arc is set up at the start when Hagrid has one line where he says that he would love a dragon. Harry has a dream at the start when he first arrives to Hogwarts that shows the entire plot, but you don't even remember it. It sits in your subconscious mind, ready to help make sense of things as they pop up and make these moments satisfying. Rowling also effectively sets us up for the next two books. Book two is foreshadowed by Malfoy in Diagon Alley when he mentions the pure bloods versus muggle-borns theme, and then again when Dumbledore says this in response to Harry asking if Voldemort is dead. No, Harry, he has not. He is still out there somewhere, perhaps looking for another body to share. And that's page 320. And book three is set up by the mention of Sirius Black in the first chapter when he gave his motorcycle to Hagrid to borrow. Rowling's writing is such a pleasure to read, but for me as a new author, it's also such a pleasure to learn from. She's so effortless and masterful. Sure, she has her writing criticisms, but they are only small complaints, like the perceived overuse of adverbs, which is honestly something that a majority of readers would never notice. I certainly didn't, and I don't feel like they cause any issues here. And so we've come to the end of my breakdown of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I'm a little sad that it's the end, but that's okay, because I'm definitely considering doing the entire series. Next episode, before we dive into Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, I'm going to be taking a look into Shadow and Bone by Lee Bardago. The Netflix series is coming out soon, so I thought I'd better read the book and see what all the fuss is about. Thank you for listening. You can find the notes and transcription of this episode, as well as a complete list of my published works on my website, ektabali.com. That's E-K-T-A-A-B-A-L-I.com. See you next time.